Okay, welcome back to the ACIP meeting. We will now reconvene the meeting to begin the next session. At first, we will have Dr. Megan Wallace presenting on COVID-19 vaccine booster doses, a benefit risk discussion. Please go ahead, Dr. Wallace. Good afternoon. Next slide, please. This presentation will focus on the benefits and risks of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. Next. Next slide, please. To assess the benefit-risk balance of a booster dose, we used a similar direct estimation approach to that presented to ACIP in previous benefit-risk discussions. Benefits were calculated per million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster. We stratified the analysis by four age groups, 18 to 29 years, 30 to 49 years, 50 to 64 years, and 65 years and older. We used a 180-day time horizon. Calculations for the benefits of vaccination were based on age-specific case incidence data from CDC and hospitalization data from COVIDnet. We used age-specific pre-booster vaccine effectiveness estimates averaged from four platforms. Vaccine effectiveness after a booster dose is unknown, but for this analysis, we assumed a post-booster VE of 95% for hospitalization and 90% for infection. Next. To obtain estimates for the current age-specific VE for hospitalization, we averaged estimates from the four platforms shown in this table for our base case. Next. For harms, we focused on the risk of myocarditis following a booster dose. While we acknowledge that there may be other risks, such as anaphylaxis, we aren't considering them in this analysis. Like benefits, harms were calculated per 1 million booster doses. Because myocarditis incidence following a third dose is unknown, we based our input on vaccine adverse event reporting system data post dose two. Next. This slide shows the reporting rates of myocarditis following Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccination per million doses administered by age and dose number in the seven day risk period following vaccination. As you can see, the incidence of myocarditis is highest among young males following dose two. Next. We perform sensitivity analyses to account for the large amount of uncertainty in the model inputs. We varied estimates for how much a booster dose would increase VE. We varied estimates for what VE is currently and modeled increased VE waning by decreasing current VE estimates by 5% intervals. And finally, we modeled variable risk by considering myocarditis incidence seen after dose two and two times that seen after dose two. Next. The framework by which we approached the booster dose benefit risk analyses was to first evaluate the benefits versus the risks of the COVID-19 booster dose. Then we evaluated the differential benefits of booster doses by age groups. And finally, we looked at the differential benefits of booster doses compared with primary series. This presentation will follow the same sequence. Next. This figure shows our base case for benefits and risks after Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 booster dose. In this scenario, we use the VE for hospitalizations averaged from four platforms with the average VE shown on the in the table on the right. We assume a boost will bring VE to 95% and that my the myocarditis risk will be equivalent to that seen after dose two. The blue bars on the left represent COVID-19 associated hospitalizations prevented by age group over 180 days per 1 million booster doses given, while the red bars on the right represent expected cases of myocarditis per million booster doses given. As you can see, for all age groups, more COVID-19 hospitalizations would be prevented than myocarditis cases expected. However, this is particularly true for those aged 65 years and older. Next. This figure builds upon the base case presented in the previous slide. However, here we assume that myocarditis risk is double to that seen after the second dose. Assuming this higher incidence of myocarditis, we still see that more hospitalizations are prevented than myocarditis cases expected for each age group. Next. However, it is important to note that myocarditis risk was not evenly distributed by sex after dose two. 
When we apply the risk distribution seen after dose two, we see that per million doses, we would expect four cases of myocarditis among females aged 18 to 29 years and 48 per million doses among males. Next. This slide further explores benefits and risks after Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 booster for persons aged 18 to 29 years with varying pre-booster VE by sex. In this scenario, we used hypothetical and varied pre-booster VEs for hospitalization. We used COVID-19 hospitalization rates stratified by sex and assumed that the booster dose would bring VE to 95%. The myocarditis risk was assumed to be equivalent to that to the risk seen after dose two, and to acknowledge the variability of myocarditis risk by age, we present a range of risk which show the risk in 25 to 29 year olds on the low end, and that, that seen in 18 to 24 year olds on the high end. In this figure, the rows, which were different age groups in the previous slides, are now varying pre-booster VE estimates. On the left side of the figure, the blue bars represent hospitalizations prevented per million doses by varying level of pre-booster VE, with males in light blue and females in dark blue. On the right, you see the expected cases of myocarditis with males in orange and females in red, with the error bars representing the range of risk seen within the age group. Here we see that when taking sex-specific hospitalization rates and myocarditis risk into account, we expect more COVID-19 hospitalizations than cases of myocarditis for all but the highest starting VE. Next. A limitation of this model is that we are assuming a constant incidence over the 180-day time horizon. To address this, we ran another scenario in which incidence rates were one-third of the current rates and were similar to the rates seen in June and July of this year. In this scenario of lower incidence, a lower pre-booster VE is needed for the benefits of a booster dose to clearly outweigh the risks in males aged 18 to 29 years. Next. COVID-19 infections prevented is another potential benefit of COVID-19 boosters. In this figure, we included potential cases prevented by assuming a current VE for infections around 78% from SCOBY et al and a boosted VE against infection of 90%. In this figure, the rows once again represent different age groups. On the left side of the figure, the blue bars represent hospitalizations prevented, while the purple bars represent infections prevented. When considering infections as the benefit of interest, we see that by giving a million booster doses, we could prevent between 7,500 to 10,000 infections over the next six months, with the most infections prevented among those aged less than 50. Next. On this slide, we are looking more explicitly at the differential benefits and risks of booster doses in persons aged 18 to 29 years compared with those aged 65 years and older. This figure continues to build on our base case for pre-booster VE against hospitalization. On the horizontal axis, we have varied estimates of post-booster effectiveness against hospitalization, and on the vertical axis, we see the change in risk of hospitalization per million doses. The blue lines represent the benefits of a reduction in COVID-19 hospitalizations, with the, blue light, the light blue shading representing the uncertainty that exists. The red lines represent the harms of an increase of myocarditis. Estimates for those aged 18 to 29 years are represented by solid lines, while those aged 65 and older are represented by dashed lines. While benefits outweigh the risks for most potential post-booster VE estimates, the benefits obtained by those aged 65 and older are an order of magnitude larger than benefits obtained by those aged 18 to 29 years. Next. Another way to think about this is the number needed to vaccinate. This figure represents the number needed to vaccinate with a booster dose to prevent one hospitalization over six months. Looking at the far right column, we see to prevent one hospitalization over six months and those aged 65 years and older, we would need to vaccinate 481 people. Prevention of one hospitalization in persons aged 18 to 29 years would require vaccinating 8,738 people. 
To prevent one hospitalization, we would need to vaccinate 19 times as many 18 to 29 year olds compared to those age 65 and older. As mentioned previously, the scenario is based off of current incidents, which is high. As incidence decreases, these numbers needed to vaccinate will increase. Next. Next, I think we, did we skip a slide? Yes. This slide expands upon the previous slide shown by, by showing the number needed to vaccinate with booster doses to prevent one hospitalization represented in blue or infection represented in purple. Over six months, this figure shows that the number needed to vaccinate is substantially lower and more evenly distributed by age for infections compared to hospitalizations. Next. Next, we looked at the relative benefits of booster doses versus primary series vaccination. In this scenario, we used our base case VE for hospitalization and VE for infection estimates from SCOBY et al. We assume a booster dose will bring VE to 95% for hospitalization and 90% for infections. To calculate hospitalizations prevented by a primary series, we assumed 1 million doses were used to provide 500,000 primary series and that the primary series provides 95% VE for hospitalization and 90% for infection. These results will be presented as number needed to vaccinate. Next. On this slide, we see the number needed to vaccinate to prevent one hospitalization over six months, comparing the booster dose in blue to the primary series in green. The number needed to vaccinate is substantially lower for all age groups for the primary series as compared to the booster dose. For those age 65 and older, you need to vaccinate 10 times as many people with a booster dose to prevent one hospitalization compared with primary series vaccination. For persons aged 18 to 29 years, the number needed to vaccinate is 22 times as high for booster compared with the primary series vaccination. Next. This analysis has several important limitations. The benefit risk analyses are very sensitive to pre-booster vaccine effectiveness estimates and effective effectiveness estimates for Delta variant are limited. The available age-specific US data are based on month of COVID-19 onset, not on duration since vaccination. The preferred pre-booster data would measure effectiveness by duration since second dose. Post-booster effectiveness and post-booster myocarditis risk are unknown and based on available evidence from the primary series. Early data has corroborated these estimates. Finally, the model assumes static incidence in VE over a six-month period. Next. In summary, this was a direct benefit-risk assessment for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster and myocarditis, which considered individual benefits of vaccination versus individual risks. Using current VE estimates, the benefit-risk balance is most favorable for adults 65 years of age and older and shows smaller benefits for the population less than 65 years of age. The benefits increase in scenarios with lower VE for prevention of hospitalization in cases, which could be seen with those at higher risk of severe disease. The risk of myocarditis after a third dose of mRNA vaccines may vary by age and sex. The highest rates of myocarditis after the second dose were seen in younger males. Next. In this presentation, we discuss the benefits and risks of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 booster dose by age. For benefits, we focus on the prevention of COVID-19 hospitalizations and cases, but there may be addi other additional benefits, such as prevention of deaths and possible prevention of transmission. For risks, we focus on the risk of myocarditis following vaccination. However, there may be other risks, such as other rare events after mRNA vaccines and short-term reactogenicity. Next. There is a fantastic team responsible for the work I presented and many collaborators both within CDC and externally that contributed data to make this analysis possible. Next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallace. Um, this presentation will be open for uh, questions related to this presentation. Uh, we will open it up for broader discussion uh, following the other two presentations. Uh, so first, I'll ask if there are any uh, members of the ACIP who wish to ask any questions, and then we'll move to our um, liaisons. 
Dr. Maldonado, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. A really very clear explanation of the risks and benefits stratified by a number of categories. I did want to ask one question about uh, equity and race and ethnicity because, for example, in California, we know that among Latinos, 39% uh, of deaths occurred under 65 as compared to 15% under and white individuals and 31% among black individuals. Um, so if you look at the data around race and ethnicity, uh, there may be a disproportionate number of deaths and potentially hospitalizations as well um, for uh, underrepresented minority groups um, under 65. So I wonder if you took uh, or you were able to parse the data out to look at race and ethnicity. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Um, in this analysis, we did not cover that, but I think this will be covered more explicitly in the ETR presentation. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Uh, Dr. Wallace, your presentation was so clear. There are no questions following your presentation from our members. Oh, okay, Dr. Gluckman. Uh, yes, you commented briefly at the uh, end of the presentation that the risk of transmission uh, or the bat, you know, uh, wasn't really considered in the modeling. If I think back to the uh, uh, approvals around Prevnar dosing in the elderly, it was eventually you know, kind of concluded that the biggest impact had to do with the immunization uh, uh, using that vaccine in younger people. Do you, do you have any way of thinking about the uh, extrapolation about the benefit in people at higher risk by reducing the amount of circulating virus? And, and uh, do you think that that's important? Yes, thanks for that. And, and we agree that that's a very important point. But at this point, we just don't have any data on transmission and, and how boosters may impact transmission. I do not see any additional hands raised, but um, it does not mean that this presentation will be closed to questions. I think what we'll do is um, we will move on to Dr. Sarah Oliver uh, next to discuss the evidence to recommendation framework, booster doses of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, Dr. Kathleen Dooling uh, will discuss clinical considerations, and then we can open up uh, the entire session for questions at that point. So uh, Dr. Oliver, please go ahead. Thank you and good morning or afternoon. Next slide. Apologies, okay. So we have presented the evidence to recommendation framework multiple times for ACIP. This is the structure to describe information considered before ACIP makes vaccine recommendation. This provides transparency around the impact of additional factors on deliberations when considering a recommendation. We know that questions around the vaccine policy for booster doses are complex. It requires some adaptation of our standard evidence to recommendation framework, which we'll walk through in these next slides. But really walking through this ETR framework today will allow us to describe the variety of factors considered before a vote today. Next slide. So as a reminder, these are the standard ETR domains we've presented previously. Next slide. And we've already begun introducing this adapted ETR framework through the previous booster dose framework discussions. But we, we will be walking through the public health problem, evaluating our booster doses needed, then we'll discuss the benefits and harms. What is the balance of benefits and harms for booster doses by age? Then values and acceptability. Do people want a booster dose? Next slide. For feasibility, how would booster doses be implemented? For resource use, what are the costs associated with booster doses? Next slide. And then finally, what are the equity considerations for booster doses? Next slide. 
So we showed this slide yesterday. Yesterday, we reviewed the data. And then last evening, FDA issued regulatory allowance. So today, ACIP will consider recommendations for use. Next slide. So today's presentation will be focused around who should be recommended to receive a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 booster dose under the current emergency use authorization based on the balance of benefits and risks. Next slide. So now for the public health problem. Are booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines needed? Next slide. This slide shows the daily trends in the number of COVID-19 cases in the United States. We are currently experiencing a large surge, second only to the one seen this past winter. The recent surge may have peaked, especially in some states that experienced their Delta surge earlier. Next slide. We have over 182 million people in this country fully vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine primary series. Next slide. This slide compares COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates among the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated population. The figure on the left shows hospitalization rates among 18 to 49 year olds. The middle is 50 to 64 year olds and the right is 65 and over. Note that for each of the graphs, the scale on the X axis is different. The green line at the bottom of each figure is the hospitalization rate among fully vaccinated individuals and the blue line is the hospitalization rate among those unvaccinated. Among adults 65 years of age and over, the incidence was 13 times higher in unvaccinated. For those less than 65, the hospitalization rates are 22 to 23 times higher in unvaccinated individuals. Next slide. So later in this presentation, you will see some of our real world evidence around booster doses from Israel. As you think through their data, we wanted to put our epidemiology in the context for the epidemiology in Israel that existed prior to initi initiation of their booster dose program. This figure compares incidence rates for COVID-19 hospitalizations in the US with severe disease in Israel among vaccinated people. July 2021 was when overall case rates were beginning to increase in both countries. The weekly hospitalization rates in the U.S. for people 65 years and older are shown in blue, and the average weekly severe disease rates in Israel in people 60 and over for July are shown in gray and are stratified by when the second dose of the vaccine was received. The rates for Israel are approximately two to five times the rates for the United States. Next slide. So we saw a detailed presentation around yesterday around the VE in the United States. So we'll provide kind of a high level summary of the data for each of these areas. First is VE waning by age. Next slide. This slide shows VE estimates against infection over time. We've seen some decreases in VE estimates for the last one to two months. This could be due to both waning immunity due to time since primary series as well as the impact of the Delta variant. In late May, Delta was around 7% of sequenced isolates. And by mid-July, this was up to 94% of sequenced isolates. Next slide. This slide shows vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic infection by age and time since vaccination. Again, this was shown yesterday, so we'll go over high-level data here, but on top is the Pfizer vaccine stratified by age, and the bottom is Moderna, uh, also stratified by age. You can see the red is uh, time since vaccination, with VE uh, slowly declining over time. Next slide. This slide shows VE estimates against hospitalization by month, you can see VE estimates have remained high over time. Next slide. Then this slide shows VE estimates against hospitalization over time, but by vaccine type. The blue shows mRNA vaccines in those 16 years of age and over. The yellow shows mRNA vaccines estimates for those 50 years of age and over. And the red is the Janssen vaccine 16 years of age and over. 
Next slide. So to summarize the VE by age scene, there's significant declines in VE against infection in individuals 65 years of age for and over for mRNA products in the Delta period. Smaller declines in VE against hospitalization in adults 65 years of age, but those are more substantial than what is seen in the younger population. Among adults less than 65 years of age, the vaccines remain effective in preventing hospitalization and severe disease. However, the vaccines may be less effective in preventing infection or symptomatic illness due to both waning over time and the Delta variant. Next slide. So then is VE waning for those with underlying medical conditions? Next slide. This slide was also shown yesterday with VE against hospitalization by those with underlying medical conditions. There is not a significant difference among VE over time for these medical conditions that had enough persons able to provide an estimate. Next slide. This is another study that evaluated VE against infection among US veterans with underlying medical conditions. This was in the pre-Delta time period, but at that time, the VE was high for both of those with a low comorbidity index and a higher comorbidity index. Next slide. So to summarize the VE by underlying medical condition, currently we have limited data to evaluate VE by a variety of underlying medical conditions. The current data show limited waning in those with at least one underlying medical condition. However, it's important to note that these estimates exclude immunocompromised individuals. In addition, the estimates may not represent effectiveness across all underlying medical condition. VE studies cannot produce estimates for rare and possibly more severe underlying conditions. There's a spectrum of underlying medical conditions with a range of severity, and many may have a varying impact in effectiveness and not fully represented in the estimate shown here. Next slide. So those with high risk occupations. Next slide. This slide shows VE against infection among healthcare providers, first responders, and frontline workers. We've described this data before, but VE against infection has waned in recent months. Next slide. So effectiveness among healthcare and other frontline essential workers are similar to estimates for the general population for the same age, where we've also seen declines against infection recently. Severe disease among vaccinated essential workers is rare. The previous data demonstrated that VE is waning uh, against infection in this population. We know that the impact of a lower VE against infection may be different among healthcare and other frontline essential workers. And we also know that many in this group were prioritized for early doses of COVID vaccines and will have had longer duration since their primary series. Next slide. So to look at how this data varies by vaccine. Next slide. This slide demonstrates VE estimates by vaccine type. The blue bubbles represent VE estimates against infection and the red bubbles represent VE estimates for hospitalization or severe disease. On the left, in, uh, estimates for mRNA vaccines combined, then estimates for the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and then the Janssen vaccine on the far right. Next slide. This data shows that VE varies by initial vaccine type. Protection against hospitalization for mRNA vaccines are high, Though we know from the previous uh, slides that this may vary somewhat by age. And protection against infection is lower for all vaccine types. Next slide. So to summarize for the public health problem, hospitalization rates are 10 to 22 times higher in vac an unvaccinated compared to vaccinated adults. Over 182 million people are fully vaccinated in the U.S. Although COVID-19 continues to be a public health problem, among persons who have received a primary series, data support continued protection against hospitalization and deaths, and we need to follow long-term outcomes among infections after vaccination. Next slide. 
So now to discuss the balance of benefits and harms for booster doses by age. Next slide. We'll look at uh, several sub-questions in this population. Uh, and first, we're going to look at, are booster doses of the COVID-19 vaccine safe and immunogenic, which will be our grade uh, aspect of ETR? Next slide. This slide out outlines the PICO question for grade. The population for grade specifically is persons 18 years of age and over who completed a primary series at least six months prior. The intervention is a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and the comparison is no booster dose, and the outcomes are listed here. Next slide. This flow diagram shows the evidence retrieval for all records included in our evidence synthesis. Two records were identified from the International Vaccine Access Center, or IVAC, systematic review of COVID-19 vaccine literature, and two were identified through other sources. All four were assessed for eligibility, and all four were included in the evidence synthesis. Next slide. There are two available observational studies for booster doses, both from Israel. Israel began administering a third dose for immunocompromised individuals on July 12th, and for all residents 60 and over on August 1st. Next slide. Oh, sorry, back. <laughs> Both studies used large data systems and included individuals that had received their second dose at least five months prior to booster administration. For both studies, the control population were individuals who had completed a two-dose series, not the unvaccinated population. Next slide. Both studies have limited follow-up period with a maximum of 21 days for documented infection and 16 days for severe disease. For grade purposes, pooled estimates were not generated because the two studies had overlapping study populations. The most representative study, bar on et al., was used for grade assessments. Next slide. The two observational studies with data used to grade symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID-19 are summarized here. One study was peer-reviewed and one is a preprint. Both studies were conducted in Israel, which required a minimum interval of five months following the second dose for booster dose eligibility. The first study by authors Barr, On et al. were used for grade because it included nationwide data. And the vaccine effectiveness comparing booster dose to a two-dose series was 91%, with a 95% confidence interval of 90.4 to 91.9. Next slide. The great evidence for the outcome, symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID, is shown here. The first line reflects data from the Phase 3 trial among adults 18 to 55, and the Phase 1 trial among adults 65 and to 85 years that was discussed yesterday. The evidence type started at 1, very serious risk of bias was present. The Phase 3 trial among adults 18 to 55 had 306 participants, and the phase one trial among adults 65 to 85 years had 12 participants. Although the sub, a subset of participants were randomized to a booster dose or other investigational vaccine, none was randomized to placebo. The only data available for grade were from a pre-post pre booster analysis and not according to randomization. Very serious indirectness was also noted because vaccine efficacy is inferred from immunobridging to the same participants after dose two, and because the formal immunobridging analysis was only performed on participants aged 18 through 55 years, which may not be representative of older participants. Serious imprecision was also noted because the number of study participants did not meet optimal infor uh, information size. Non-inferiority was declared for the geometric mean titer one month after the booster dose versus one month after dose two. The evidence was type four or very low for this critical outcome. The second line shows grade for the observational study data, which starts at an evidence level type three or low. Very serious concern for indirectness was noted because the study outcome was any SARS-CoV-2 infection, which was an indirect measure of the PICO outcome of symptomatic COVID. Additionally, the short duration of follow-up likely limited an accurate assessment of VE. No serious concerns for risk of bias, inconsistency, or imprecision were noted. 
the relative risk of 0.9 favored the booster dose vaccination. However, the absolute effect was small, with an estimated 277 fewer cases per 100,000. The evidence type was four or very low for this observational study data. Next slide. The grade evidence table for hospitalization for COVID is shown here. One observational study provided data. The initial evidence type of three was downgraded for very serious indirectness. The outcome of the study was severe COVID, which is an indirect measure of the PICO outcome for hospitalization for COVID. Additionally, the short duration of follow-up likely limited an accurate assessment of VE. The relative risk of 0.5 favored vaccination However, the absolute effect was small with an estimated 26 fewer cases of severe COVID per 100,000. The evidence type was four or very low for this critical outcome. Next slide. The grade evidence table for serious adverse events and reactogenicity based on the phase three randomized control trial data is shown here. For both outcomes, a very serious risk of bias was present because a non-random subset of participants who received a booster dose are compared to the safety population from the two-dose efficacy trial at the time of the BLA. For serious adverse events, there was also serious concern for indirectness and very serious concern for imprecision. The relative risk was 0.2 with wide confidence intervals and did not rule out harms. The evidence was type four or very low for this critical outcome. For reactogenicity, there was serious concern for indirectness and in imprecision. The relative risk was 0.6, indicating a lower risk of grade three reactions in the booster compared to the primary series. The evidence type was four or very low. Next slide. So then while not specifically included in grade, we also did want to note a finding mentioned by Pfizer yesterday. There were 5% of individuals in their phase three trial who received booster doses that reported lymphadenopathy. This was all axillary lymphadenopathy, and only one severe event of lymphadenopathy was noted. This was reported more frequently following booster doses at 5.2% compared to 0.4% after the primary series. Next slide. Then we can also use the experience from Israel to inform our knowledge of safety of booster doses. Um, again, uh, uh, the rollout initially began with adults over 60 and was expanded to those over 12 at the very end of August. Around 2.8 million third doses have been administered to persons 12 years of age and over, but most of those doses currently have been given to persons over 60. The rates of reported systematic, local, neurologic, allergic, and other reactions were lower after dose three than after dose one or two, but there's likely underreporting. We did want to note also that Israel has noted one case of myocarditis to date after a booster dose in an individual 30 years of age and over. Due to limited follow-up time, we're unable to determine the rates of myocarditis in younger adults from the Israeli data av uh, available to date. Next slide. So this table summarizes the grade assessment for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for persons 18 years of age and over who completed a COVID primary series six months ago or more. In terms of benefits, beginning with the prevention of symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID, the available data indicate that the Pfizer-BioNTech booster dose induced an immune response non-inferior to those following dose two. Observational data suggest a increased protective effect against any SARS-CoV-2 infection, and the evidence type was four. For hospitalization due to COVID, the observational data suggest a protective effect against severe COVID, and the evidence type was also four. No other data were available on the important outcomes of death due to COVID or transmission of SARS-CoV-2 infections. Next slide. So then to discuss the benefit risk assessment by age. Next slide. We just heard from Dr. Wallace's presentation the number needed to vaccinate with a booster dose to prevent one hospitalization over six months. You can see that this number varies substantially by age. Over 19 times more individuals 18 to 29 would need to be vaccinated to prevent one hospitalization compared to those 65 years of age and over. Next slide. 
Again, I won't go through the data again, but just wanted to highlight that the benefit risk balance among the younger population varies by sex, the VE after the booster dose, rates of myocarditis, and incidence. As incidence declines, there will be more uncertainty around the balance of benefits and risks. Next slide. So to summarize that benefit risk assessment, the risks of myocarditis after a third dose of mRNA vaccines are unknown. We know that after the second dose, the risk varies by age and sex, so we may see similar patterns after a booster dose. The benefit risk balance is the most favorable for adults 65 years of age and over using current estimates of vaccine effectiveness. The benefit risk balance among younger population varies by sex, VE after the booster dose, rates of myocarditis, and incidence. In addition, if so, if the incidence increases, the benefits would increase. But as incidence declines, there would be more uncertainty around this balance of benefits and risks. Next slide. So moving to the summary of benefits and harms by age and population. Next slide. We know the data from the clinical trial are limited in size and age. The booster dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine increases the immune response in those who have completed a primary series approximately six months previously. And again, the individual balance of benefits and risks varies by age. The largest benefit of vaccination is in individuals 65 years of age and over. The benefits to the other ages are incrementally smaller given higher VE currently maintained from the primary series. However, we know that even within those age categories, there is likely variation within the balance of benefits and risks given risk of exposure, medical condition, and sex. Our analysis of the benefits and risks also may be able to unaccount for other benefits there may be impossible impact on rates of community transmission as well. Next slide. So next to move to values and acceptability. Do people want a booster dose? Next slide. In published surveys completed in August, 76 to 87% of vaccinated adults reported they would get a booster dose if available. And in one survey, this increased to 93% of adults if it was recommended by their primary care provider. Next slide. This slide shows detailed data from an unpublished survey. When vaccinated respondents were asked if they would receive a booster dose, around two thirds said they would get one as soon as possible. Others said they would wait to see if it works or if it is safe. Only 2% of vaccinated respondents said they would definitely not get a booster. Next slide. Then when the unvaccinated respondents were asked about boosters, around one third of unvaccinated respondents said that a recommendation for COVID booster doses would make them less likely to get vaccinated at all. Next slide. Individuals were also asked who they believe should be prioritized for early receipt of COVID booster doses. Most individuals highlighted healthcare workers, long-term care facility residents, and those 75 years of age and over. Next slide. Then individuals felt that essential workers, those aged 60 to 74, and other countries should be prioritized for vaccines. Next slide. And finally, adults less than 65 years of age were the least prioritized group. Next slide. In summary, at least two thirds of vaccinated adults are willing to receive a booster dose. And survey respondents prioritized older adults and healthcare workers for booster doses, while younger adults were less prioritized. Next slide. Moving to feasibility and implementation, how would booster doses be implemented? Next slide. This slide shows those who completed the primary series by week. This is the bell-shaped curve we've seen before over uh, doses administered. The blue is for J&J &J vaccine, Moderna in orange, and the Pfizer in gray. Next slide. This slide shows the same data, but for adults 65 years of age and over, you can see that this curve is skewed to the left 
as this group was prioritized for early vaccine doses. Next slide. Then if we overlay uh, those who would have completed the primary series six months and more, those to the left of the line would be eligible. Next slide. This slide shows the curves for those other age groups as well. 50 to 64 on top, 30 to 49 in the middle, and 18 to 29 on the bottom. Next slide. If we overlay the six month eligibility on these curves, you can see how this lays out for the other age groups as well. Next slide. Then this slide shows the number of persons eligible in millions for people who would be eligible on September 27th with six months or more since their primary series. It's a total of 53 million individuals, 27 million of those are 65 years of age and over. Next slide. We know that jurisdictions have begun preparing for implementation of booster doses. Booster doses will be given in a variety of settings, pharmacies, provider offices, health departments, occupational clinics, and federal programs, such as the long-term care facility program. Over 70% of current COVID vaccine administration is occurring in pharmacies. We do know that many jurisdictions are experiencing a surge in cases of COVID-19 while continuing to do outreach for unvaccinated individuals to receive a primary series and beginning the fall and winter influenza campaigns. Next slide. We know that there is variation in those who had uh, dose in what was received as a primary series. There are three vaccines currently being administered in the United States. For additional doses of mRNA vaccines in immunocompromised persons, the current recommendations state that an additional dose should be the same product as the primary series. If the product given for the first two doses is not available, the other product may be administered. However, the evidence reviewed by FDA only evaluated a booster dose of a Pfizer BioNTech vaccine after completion of a Pfizer vaccine. Next slide. Long-term care facilities can arrange for on-site vaccination clinic or can help residents access vaccine in a local community. The federal long-term care facility program can help implement vaccinations in these long-term care facility settings. We know 8.1 million doses were administered during the original long-term care facility program from December of 2020 to March of 2021. 76% of those doses given were Pfizer and 24% were Moderna. In addition, those at the long-term care facilities now may not be the same individuals who were there six months ago due to substantial turnover over time. Cities have previously demonstrated turnover of 30% per month for residents than 100% per year for staff. Next slide. We also wanted to highlight an issue that could impact implementation. Our definition of fully vaccinated. Current CDC clinical considerations state that for public health purposes, uh, immunocompromised persons who have completed a primary vaccine series, so two doses of an mRNA vaccine or a single dose of Janssen, are considered fully vaccinated two weeks or more after completion of the primary series. Based on our current data, the definition of fully vaccinated would remain the same after recommendations for booster dose, the fully vaccinated two weeks or more after completion of the primary series. This can be evaluated as we learn additional information over time. Next slide. So in summary to date, we know that over 220 million doses of a Pfizer vaccine have been administered in the US, demonstrating that the vaccine is feasible to implement. We also know that over 2 million individuals have already received an additional dose. Over 27 million adults 65 years of age and over completed their primary series six months ago, and 50 million adults 18 years of age and over completed their primary series six months ago or more. We know that pharmacies are delivering the majority of COVID-19 vaccines currently. And we know that recommendations that are clear and simple will facilitate implementation. Next slide. So to discuss resource use or the cost associated with booster doses. Next slide. All COVID vaccines, including booster doses, will be provided free of charge to the U.S. population. 
However, we know that health systems or health departments could incur costs for vaccination program planning and implementation. Fees for administration of COVID-19 vaccines recommended by ACIP are reimbursable by insurance or other federal programs. The work group has expressed that cost effectiveness analyses will be important in the future when the vaccine is not purchased and distributed by the federal government. Next slide. So to move to equity with the equity considerations for booster doses. Next slide. Hispanic or Latino, Black or African American, and American Indian or Alaskan Native populations have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. These populations have experienced higher rates of infection and mortality compared with the non-Hispanic white population, and greater excess mortality, which is the percentage increase in the number of persons who have died relative to the expected number of deaths for a given place and time. This slide shows the annual excess death incidence rates for persons aged 25 to 64 years by race and ethnicity in the United States. During the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, American Indian Alaskan Native and Black populations had the highest annual excess mortality incidence rates among those aged 25 to 64 years. Next slide. This slide illustrates cumulative COVID-19 associated hospitalizations in the US by race and ethnicity over time. As of mid-September, American Indian and Alaskan Native, Black and Hispanic populations had the highest COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates compared to the overall population, whereas white and Asian Pacific Island populations had the lowest. Next slide. So now we'll take a look at the percentage of people in each race or ethnic group who have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. As of mid-September, American Indian and Alaskan Native, a Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander and Asians have the highest percentage of those who have received at least one dose, whereas the black population was the lowest at 34%. Next slide. We know there's also been variation over time for the vaccination rates by race and ethnicity. This figure shows that the American Indian Alaskan Native populations in red have consistently had the highest percentage among those who, who have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. The Hispanic or Latino population started at a lower proportion, but have increased faster than other races over recent months. Next slide. Among VE platforms able to provide specific evidence for vaccine effectiveness by race or ethnicity, no differences were noted as shown here, including VE against hospitalization among adults 50 years of age and over, and VE against hospitalization among VA centers. Next slide. So COVID-19 disease and COVID-19 vaccination varies by socioeconomic and sociodemographic groups. However, vaccine effectiveness does not vary by race and ethnicity. The equity gap in vaccine administered by race is closing, but we know that the disparities were more pronounced this spring, which would be individuals who had received, who had been six months or more after their second dose. Next slide. Uh, so now for a summary in the work group interpretation. Next slide. The work group continues to emphasize that the top priority should be continued vaccination of unvaccinated individuals. In addition, the work group noted that jurisdictions have a variety of vaccination and disease control priorities. For example, surges in COVID cases, delivery of primary COVID-19 vaccine, as well as influenza vaccines. The work group discussed that the balance of benefits and risks varies by age. Adults 65 years of age and over have the clearest benefit risk. The benefit to other age groups is incrementally smaller given the high effectiveness maintained from the primary series. And finally, the work group discussed the goals of the booster program. First, for prevention of severe disease. But the work group also discussed that other considerations are important, such as maintaining workforce and healthcare capacity, prevention of transmission, and the individual benefit risk balance. Next slide. So I'll pause now and um, turn to Dr. Dooling who can provide the clinical considerations.
Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to review the existing interim clinical considerations for the use of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine, as well as the proposed groups for whom a booster may be considered. Next slide. So you've heard this previously, but I wanted to reiterate that for public health purposes, people who have completed a primary series of vaccine, for example, uh, two doses of an mRNA series or a single dose of the Janssen vaccine, are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after completion of the primary series. This definition applies to all people, including those who receive an additional dose as recommended for moderate to severely immunocompromised people, as well as those who may receive a booster dose in the future. Next slide, please. So Pfizer-BioNTech COVID uh, vaccine uh, is administered as a 0.3 milliliter intramuscular uh, injection. Uh, it should be noted that this is the exact same formulation uh, and dose and route as has been previously authorized and approved for the Pfizer COVID vaccine. With regard to the timing of a booster dose, a single dose uh, should be given at least six months uh, or more after completion of the primary series. It's important to note that immuni immunity wanes gradually over time. Therefore, it's not necessary for the booster dose to be given exactly at six months. In fact, a booster dose may be given at, uh, at a period of six months or more after the primary series. In terms of co-administration, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine booster may be given uh, with other vaccines uh, without regard to timing. This includes simultaneous administration of COVID-19 uh, vaccines, uh, sorry, with a Pfizer vaccine and other vaccines on the same day. Next slide, please. So next, let's review the groups at risk for severe COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, even after vaccination with a primary series. Next. So increasing age is a strong risk factor for severe COVID. Here we describe an age-based group, which includes people 65 years of age and older. Uh, there's an increased risk for severe COVID-19, including hospitalization and death in this age group of vaccinated people compared to younger fully vaccinated people. In addition, waning of COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness against severe disease has been observed in people 65 and older. Next slide. The next group we'd like to outline are uh, residents of long-term care facilities. Although most residents in long-term care facilities are over 65 years of age, this is a risk-based group and would include any residents 18 years of age and older. Uh, there is likely an increased risk of severe COVID-19, uh, including hospitalization and death among fully vaccinated residents compared to uh, fully vaccinated people who are living independently and waning of COVID-19 vaccine protection against infection has been observed in long-term care facility residents. In addition, congregate living settings are associated with increased risk for COVID-19. Next slide. So the next group is risk-based uh, by occupation or setting. So this group includes people 18 years and older who are fully vaccinated and may be at increased risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection due to frequent exposure in their occupation or other setting. Moreover, uh, in an individual's absence from their occupation due to SARS-CoV-2 infection may hinder societal functions. Examples are, but are certainly not limited to, uh, essential workers, both frontline and non-frontline, paid, unpaid caregivers of frail or immunocompromised persons, um, paid and unpaid workers who interact within less than six feet of others, and also people who live in congregate settings, such as homeless shelters or correctional facilities. Next slide. The final risk-based group we include here are people 18 years of age and older with underlying medical conditions. Fully vaccinated people with underlying medical conditions may be at risk for severe COVID-19 if they become infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 
Examples of underlying medical conditions associated with severe COVID include, but are not limited to, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, COPD, diabetes, heart conditions, obesity, pregnancy, and smoking. Next slide. Now, let's take a look at the factors for consideration for individual level assessment of benefits and risks for COVID-19, a COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. Next slide. First, let's review the potential benefits uh, to an individual uh, that they should consider. A booster dose uh, may confer reduced risk of infection and severe disease. The strongest evidence for the benefit of a reduction of severe disease is in older adults. The vaccine effectiveness of an mRNA primary series remains high in younger age groups. A booster dose of COVID vaccine may confer reduced risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Waning of vaccine protection via a combination of factors such as uh, time since vaccination and Delta variant has been observed in most age groups. It's important to note that infections here refers to here to both symptomatic and asymptomatic infections. The reduction of either asymptomatic or symptomatic infections may reduce a work absence and preservation of capacity of important sectors. Stated another way, prevention of infection may protect healthcare capacity and other ser essential services for the COVID-19 response and maintain the overall functioning of society. Next slide. Now let's review the potential risks to an individual uh, which they should consider. Myocarditis and myopericarditis, although very rare, may occur following an mRNA vaccination. It's more common in younger ages, particularly males age younger than 30 years old. Most patients with myocarditis uh, have been hospitalized for short periods, and the majority of whom uh, achieve res resolution of their uh, acute symptoms. The rate of myocarditis following a booster dose is not yet known. Anaphylaxis, although very rare, uh, may occur following uh, a COVID vaccination. The rate of anaphylaxis following a booster dose is not yet known. Reactogenicity, including transient, local, and systemic symptoms, are more common following are common following mRNA vaccines. The third dose of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine appears to have similar reactogenicity as the second dose. Next slide. And finally, when assessing the benefits and risks, an individual should consider their own risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure. For example, individuals can assess their risk of, exp of exposure in occupational, living, and transportation settings. Uh, their ability, for example, to consistently wear a mask and maintain social distance and other mitigation measures and ultimately their risk of exposure due to rates of SARS-CoV-2 infection in their own community. Individuals can also consider their risk of developing severe COVID-19 if infected. This may be influenced by underlying medical conditions, particularly if those conditions are not well controlled. And individuals can also consider their personal circumstances. For example, if they are living with or caring for a frail or immunocompromised person, as well as the consequences of inability to meet personal or uh, occupational obligations due to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next slide. Next, we'll go on to um, review contraindications, precautions, and other adverse events following immunization. Next slide. So the contraindications and precautions would be the same for booster doses as for the primary series of a Pfizer COVID vaccine. And as a reminder, uh, that's contraindications uh, including severe allergic reaction, such as anaphylaxis after a previous dose, or an immediate allergic reaction to a previous dose or known allergy to a component of the vaccine. Known polysorbate allergy is a precaution to mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide. Um, so if their uh, myocarditis or myopericarditis occurs following a dose of mRNA vaccine, it's recommended to defer uh, a subsequent dose. And the people who choose to receive a subsequent dose should wait until myocarditis or myopericarditis uh, has completely resolved. And it should be noted that the aforementioned uh, conditions, uh, certainly the ones that result in contraindication or precaution, are extremely rare. 
Next slide. Um, so there are many resources that can be found on the uh, clinical considerations uh, section of the CDC website. Those include um, information about anaphylaxis and um, its management in the vaccine uh, setting. Next slide. Uh, as well as additional resources. And I will pause there and hand it back to Dr. Oliver. Thank you so much. So we want to highlight that there, the slide reviews the types of recommendations that ECIP can make, as well as what this recommendation would mean for the balance of benefits and risks. On the left, ACIP cannot recommend the intervention. This would occur when it's felt that across the population, the risks outweigh the benefits. Then on the far right, ACIP can recommend the intervention. This would be used when the benefits clearly outweigh the risks in the population. Then this category in the middle, ACIP can recommend the intervention for individuals based on an assessment of benefits and risks. This could be used when there is a diversity of the benefits and risks within a population. This type of vote could allow for flexibility across a population when there is more variation around the balance of benefits and risks. Next slide. So we'll propose some questions for discussion to ECIP and walk through some of the pros and cons for each. These can continue to be uh, uh, discussed over uh, the, the time period of discussion for the next um, bit. So for policy question number one, should adults 65 years of age and over and long-term care facility residents receive a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster dose? Next slide. And then thinking through, should adults 18 to 64 years of age at risk for severe COVID-19 due to underlying medical conditions or at risk for SARS-CoV-2 exposure due to occupation or setting receive a Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine booster dose? Next slide. To first talk through some pros and cons in the adult 65 years of age and over and long-term care facility residents population. We know that this is the highest, the group with the highest risk of severe disease. They also have the uh, largest impact in waning VE against severe disease as was seen recently. We also know that they were prioritized for early doses of COVID-19 vaccines and thus have had a longer duration since their primary series. However, we acknowledge that a specific age cutoff does not represent the continuum of risk that we see with age. Next slide. So then thinking through this other population, adults 18 to 64 at risk for severe COVID due to underlying medical conditions or at risk for SARS-CoV-2 exposure due to occupation or setting. We'll walk through the pros and cons of this population with the standard recommendation on top, what we said with ACIP recommends the intervention, and then the recommendation based on the assessment of benefits and risks on the bottom. First, for the standard recommendation, for the pros, we know that this would be simple. It would reduce barriers for individuals who may have increased risk of severe disease and may end in, reduction in, in, in a reduction in infection could reduce work absenteeism. However, there is currently not strong evidence of an increased risk of hospitalization or death in all individuals in this population. Therefore, based on that, the balance of benefits and risks in this population uh, likely varies. And we know that there's a large number of people that would be initially eligible in this group. So then thinking through the pros and cons of recommending this group based on an assessment of benefits and risks. Again, it would reduce barriers for individuals who may have an increased risk of disease. Again, the, a reduction in infection could reduce work absenteeism. And this balance of benefits and risk recommendation could reflect the uncertainty in the current balance of benefits and risks across this entire population. For a con standpoint, again, it's a large number of people initially eligible. 
And the um, popu- the recommendation based on an assessment of benefits and risks may be more complement- uh, complicated to implement and communicate. So we can go back, sorry, two slides to the policy questions. So with this, we'll um, propose these as questions for ACIP to discuss and can modify based on the discussion. Thanks so much, Dr. Lee. Um, Thank you so much. I have to say that was an outstanding series of presentations with an unbelievable amount of information that I think addressed the questions that the committee has brought um, to you all over the past two meetings. Um, And we recognize that uh, given the totality of the data we're looking at today, this is still going to be a challenging decision. So um, I am going to open it up, but I'm actually going to suggest we structure the discussion as such, which is um, I'm going to ask my ACIP colleagues to comment on um, policy question number one and policy question number two, specifically also considering the type of recommendation you might consider. And... Um, I would also, if you were willing to comment on any gaps or opportunities for refining risk groups that are feasible, uh, would ask that you um, provide that comment as well. Um, So with that, I appreciate um, as many members as uh, willing to contribute as possible to this uh, discussion. So Dr. Paling, we'll start with you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Oliver and Dr. Dooling for an outstanding presentation. One of the points I wanted to start with that you emphasized or that you stated and I wanted to emphasize is that we are going to consider persons who have completed the primary vaccine series as fully vaccinated for any mandate. And I think that's a very important point because it gives people an opportunity but doesn't require. Um, I um, support the policy number one. It's clear from the data that the um, risk of hospitalization is going up in 65 years and older in long-term care facilities, and um, the benefits outweigh the rest. Um, I wanted to talk about policy number two, Um, and I think a lot about the immunocompromised. And when I think about the immunocompromised, I'm thinking about children who we don't yet, especially those under 12 where we don't have a vaccine yet, as well as adults in the full spectrum. And if I understood the setting, we are including those people in this recommendation um, under setting. So the caregivers of uh, a young child who is medically fragile or immunocompromised would be included. Is that correct? Thank you for that question. Um, so yes, your your reading is correct that uh, we have drawn setting to uh, be quite broad and include settings uh, where a person is a, a caregiver for an immunocompromised or frail person. Okay. And so then the second point is getting into the two recommendations because I think the intent is to allow availability without mandating. And so trying to walk that fine balance uh, is where I'm trying um, to strike. And so I see several of my colleagues would like to speak, so I'm going to turn my phone over and listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. And uh, of course, feel free to raise your hand again. Dr. Cotton? Thank you. I'd like to just emphasize that for um, policy question number one, that making that age cutoff of 65 and older, there's an equity issue there where age of 65 is not the same um, across all different racial groups. And uh, we have seen different outcomes at different ages across different races with COVID. So I do worry um, that that may not meet the our intent for um, trying to ensure as much equity as possible. Um, furthermore, for policy question two, I sort of wish that this were divided into two separate questions in that um, it may be hard to reach agreement, um, at least from my perspective, on the two questions or the two areas, the underlying medical conditions. I wish that that had been separated from occupational and um, setting. Um, but I'm happy to hear what my colleagues have to say about that. Um, 
Dr. Cohn would wish to uh, say something, and I have a clarifying question for you, Dr. Cotton, afterwards. Thanks, everyone. Um, as you are all thinking through these two policy questions, I just wanted to remind um, everyone, and Dr. Cotton just brought this up um, really nicely, that we um, are basing these policy questions on the language that works in the conditions of use uh, from the FDA authorization that happened last night. And so this policy question number one is based on that first category, um, that 65 plus. And so unfortunately, we don't have um, flexibility in that question to shift the age group. For policy question number two, um, Dr. Cotton, we can certainly split this up into a discussion on underlying medical conditions um, and exposure to occupation and setting, and, and we'd like perspectives on both. But there is an opportunity to shift some of the age groups around in that question. For example, you could um, have individuals down to a lower age who are at severe risk for disease um, have a full recommendation as compared to the more um, uh, individual level uh, recommendation for other types of groups, if those are some of the things that you're considering. So um, one way to address the equity issue that we can't really address in policy question number one would be to um, shift some things around in policy question number two. Uh, thank you. And I was actually, uh, I had this a very uh, simple question to ask, which is, in order to address equity, uh, at what age would you sort of go down to would be my question, Dr. Cotton. You know, so I think it's variable across different um, different groups. So we'd have to maybe look at that. Although I, I appreciate that in the setting of the FDA EUA that we uh, don't have a lot of leeway there. I just wanted to emphasize that the age of 65 is sort of a somewhat arbitrary cutoff based on data, but it's not the age 65 is not the same across all different racial groups. Um, but I appreciate the um, restrictions of the FDA EUA. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Yeah, so I, I have a couple points. I'm kind of, I think a policy one and policy two, um, similarly with these points. I think we have looked at data showing some decline in VE um, for the Pfizer BioNTech, and there are probably reasons for that, including the short interval between doses one and two and the lower dose compared to, with, compared to the other mRNA vaccine. But to me, the biggest policy question out there is the Johnson and Johnson. Um, and that has much lower VE. And so I, I, I worry we're getting distracted by the question of boosters of Pfizer when we have bigger and more important things to do in the pandemic. And along those lines, um, we're fighting a pandemic and it's not because people got two doses of vaccine. It's because people are unvaccinated. And I really feel like, yes, we may move the needle a little bit by giving a booster dose to um, people and not just those at risk or at age. I just, I really think we could move the needle a little bit if we gave it to everybody. But the real fact of the matter is this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The hospitals are full because people aren't vaccinated. We are declining care to people who deserve care because we are full of unvaccinated COVID positive patients. So I, in all honesty, I, you know, we could give boosters to people, but that's not really the answer to this pandemic. And I, I'm scared I'm gonna get quoted for this, but I feel like we're putting lipsticks on frogs. Like this is not going to solve the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. And um, I, we will ask if our FDA colleagues can respond, but I'm actually gonna go through a few more questions just to see if there are any other re questions relevant uh, to our colleagues at the FDA. So next I'll call on Dr. Alt. As far as knowledge gaps for policy question number two, we have, as we, everybody heard yesterday, we have pregnant women in the group that have an underlying medical condition that makes them at risk for, uh, for worsening disease. We also have uh, healthcare workers who are skewed towards younger and female. So there'll be hundreds and thousands of health, pregnant healthcare workers at any one time that are pregnant or lactating. So we have some complicated questions to answer for pregnant people that fall into, uh, under that category. 
However, similar to what Dr. Talbot just said, we have a majority of pregnant women that are that have received zero doses of the vaccine. Uh, so we'll have to address that somehow. Thank you, Dr. Alch. Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, I just want a few comments. And certainly I I think we have to remember, and I agree with Dr. Talbot and Dr. Alch, um, I think we have to remember that we're talking about booster dosing, and these are individuals who already have agreed to receive a vaccine um, and to be fully vaccinated. So I think there the equity issue is a little bit different because of the blacks and you know the efficacy of the vaccine from what we just heard was similar to, um, in, in irrespective of the um, of the um, you know racial ethnic characteristics, but um, but I, I agree with policy question one. I have some issues with policy question two. I kind of agree with Dr. Cotton, maybe some of that needs to be separated out, but um, I don't read into policy question two, help um, parents or other individuals who are caring for immunocompromised hosts at home if they don't have um, an underlying, you know, like, you know, if they are less than 65 and they're otherwise healthy, I don't see that because um, they're, they may not be at risk for severe COVID-19 due to underlying medical condition, because they're not, they're healthy parent or at risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure due to occupation setting. That's not really, what we're trying to do is, pre is for the child to be prevent, to have that prevention. So I don't think that setting you can read into it, but I don't see it there. And then my other comment is um, from reading what I saw from the FDA um, com, um, recommendation was that individuals 18 to 64 years of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2 puts them at high risk of serious complications of COVID-19 including severe COVID-19. Um, I'm not reading that into policy question two because I think we're expanding that. And if that's allowed, I guess that's fine. But I think that's a little bit different when it comes to healthcare workers and young who, who may not be at high risk of, of, um, of severe disease. And we're talking then about infection. Um. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, I'm going to ask uh, for those of you who have had a chance to speak to put your hands down and then re-raise them if you would like to um, add another comment. I'm going to move to Dr. Brooks. All right, thank you. First of all, excellent presentation. It shows the complexity of the question. I think that was actually your job. I mean, you, there was no way to simplify this, so you just presented the information. A couple of things. First, as relates to what Dr. Cotton said, the evidence for African Americans shows that their increased risk of uh, death or hospitalization increases dramatically at age 50. So to answer that question, age 50. Now that being stated, it is likely that a lot of that is uh, related to underlying medical conditions. So if this were a, a policy question two were adopted in any fashion, that would mitigate some of that. I'm in agreement with policy question number one, by the way. Um, a couple of things I think we really need to remember. Number one, this recommendation is only for those who have received the full um, series of the Pfizer vaccine. So when we look at those eligible, there was a statement of what, I think it was 27 million that might be eligible. I can't remember whether those were those that received Pfizer only. I don't believe, I'm not sure if that's correct or incorrect. Another thing is that a lot of this is gonna be based on the availability of vaccines. 76 to 93% of people who've had two doses are willing to get a booster. So then those that want a booster can get it. Importantly, there was very little downside other than lack of vaccine availability. The, the side effect profile, the uh, serious adverse reactions, myocarditis, et cetera, are relatively low, or the risk was the same as with the two dose series. So the point is if someone wants to get the vaccine and they are in the category, there's really uh, no major risk. Um, I think that I 
One thing concerns me is it's a statement that one third of the unvaccinated said a booster would make them less likely to get vaccinated. So a recommendation for a booster might reduce our ability to get those unvaccinated to be vaccinated. Uh, on balance, though, I think that policy question number two in a flexible recommendation would have a lot of uh, positivity. The la last thing I'll say is that if we did policy question two as a full recommendation, would that then, as we've discussed, lead to a mandate, which might be uh, somewhat problematic? Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're just sorry. I'm trying trying to find the right cadence here, which is um, uh, we don't want to go too many questions in. So we're going to answer just some of the key points that were raised. Um, Dr. Oliver will go first, and we'll see if uh, any of our other colleagues on the line can uh, jump in if there's any other issues we'd like to address. Dr. Brooks, in the, the presentation, it went by quickly, but we did break out the um, receipt by primary series. So you can see here that there were, if we went with the six months or more after primary series, there's 26 million individuals who received Pfizer. Of those 13 million individuals are 65 years of age and over. Thank you, that was my question, a question. Um, this is Amanda. I'm just going to make a couple of other comments um, that have been uh, to, to start to respond to questions that have been raised. So our FDA colleagues um, can um, discuss um, the issue when they're ready. Uh, Doran or Peter, if you all want to raise your hand around um, uh, some of these questions that have been asked around the EUA and um, specifically recipients of J&J &J vaccine. Um, I think that was uh, Kip who brought that issue up. Um, we'll also, um, the, the issue of, um, immunocomp of people who are living in the home of immunocompromised um, persons, you will note that the um, language in the um, FDA EUA says occupational or um, uh, uh, institutional um, risk. Uh, so this language is a little bit different than the FDA, but we believe has the same intent. And so um, I think from that perspective, I'd ask that the ACIP members not worry about how this discussion is in line with the, you know, exactly in line with the intent of the FDA EUA. Um, and we will make sure that those two, that, that we are within those conditions of use before issuing any final recommendations. Um, and then um, we are working on separating out the two policy. Oh, you can see it already. We have, um, we now have this as three policy questions, but just note that these age ranges, the 18 to 64 years of age, you could, for example, say, you could split those ages and have different recommendations for different ages, although we certainly want to try to keep these recommendations um, reasonable from a simple perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, I, at this point, let's move on to Ms. Bata. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and um, thank you, Dr. Dooling and Dr. Oliver for this um, very comprehensive review. Um, I have um, just a question relating to um, the clinical guidance, um, and there's nothing that addresses the probably the most common question we'll hear, and that's about um, the mixing of vaccine products. And I don't need an answer to that, but it just um, to me was blatantly absent, and. and um, that I'm already getting questions about that. Um, I, I too just um, want to talk a little bit about the, these policy questions as we face them um, in moving toward all, all of these um, different questions. Um, I really think that it sends a message that people haven't gotten enough and that they've got to get more. And as um, Dr. Talbot so eloquently um, described it, that, that that's not going to end the pandemic. I feel like 
those who were vaccinated felt like that was the magic bullet and so many abandoned the other mitigation measures um, because we heard that it was okay to do so. And um, we're now in a situation where um, both um, the unvaccinated, of course, are becoming very, very ill, but also the, vac the vaccinated um, are getting sick. And that, again, um, reduces the confidence that people have in the vaccine. And so if we are moving forward with these, and I, I certainly do support policy question one, um, and I think we need to adjust policy question two to include a more equitable, equitable consideration. But I, um, I think that we need to make sure that we are um, talking about this as only one measure um, that we are in the throes of a pandemic and this is what everyone needs to do, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And of course, some people will listen and some people won't, but I think that we need the vaccinated individuals also to understand that they need to keep doing what has been recommended from the beginning. Um, because I think that that's a, a big piece. Um, and as I mentioned um, yesterday, my concern is that we're just going to keep giving booster doses to the vaccinated um, as uh, different variants uh, come in to the scene, and we're not going to be able to move forward in in uh, truly mitigating the the pandemic. Um, so, in terms of an age group, um, I would like to see something like um, 50 um, through 64. Uh, because we know that there's a large group of individuals in that um, in that age range who um, have similar risk as as those um, 65 and older. And again, it's I, I want to make sure we're not implying that they aren't protected because most are. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bata. Uh, Dr. Long. Yeah, I, I'm going to try to. See if we can't steer back to the questions that have the data at hand. And I think what should be the small steps that we should take at this point, considering all those things. I think it is imperative to protect people from death, hospitalizations, and we're only talking about a booster. So that I think that although people of different races and ethnicities certainly age differently, we have had absolutely no data that there is a diminution of vaccine protection or antibody responses that follow race uh, or ethnicity. So although we may see more severe disease in people under 65, I haven't seen the data in breakthrough disease that that is the case, at least to any extent. Um, I also assume for policy question number one, that in, in addition to long-term care facility, as has been done previously, we're talking about everybody in congregate living. And if that's not the case, I, I'd like to talk about that some more. And the other thing that I am assuming, and it's clear that I should not assume this, is that this recommendation for people over 65, 65 and older would be a preference for Pfizer vaccine as the primary, but an allowance for those to receive the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine booster, had they received uh, Moderna or Janssen. And um, th there's a whole lot more to say about policy. So I'm in favor of, of policy number one um, as an age-based and uh, long-term care facility, as well as congregate living. Uh, we can talk about the mixing and matching a little bit further. Um, I think it would be just anathema to, to preclude uh, people from getting Pfizer if they had had a different um, primary. For the second question, again, I don't see that we have had evidence that underlying medical conditions reduce 
the protection. We know that if you get the disease, you're at, more, you're at higher risk for having bad outcomes, but we haven't seen the waning in that younger age group in the groups we have seen, and I, I, I agree, we don't have all the groups, but the groups we have uh, doesn't look as if there's substantial waning. So I think with the data at hand, without having any, everybody able to get a matched vaccine, um, and without the data, how, how that will pan out, and without having all vaccines available for boosters, I think that would be a giant step to go for underlying conditions. Uh, and the third one, is, and I agree that this, the second one is risk for severe disease. Uh, so I don't think that extends from caretakers to the people they take care of. I, and I'm gonna wait on policy question number three because I think that's rather thorny and um, others will want to speak to these. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, for our uh, future questioners or commenters, I'm just going to ask if you can try and keep it to, uh, you know, under two minutes would be great. Um, <laughs> a minute would be ideal. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to call on Dr. Daly, then we'll pause for a moment. And actually, I'm going to ask Dr. Fink from the FDA if he can uh, comment on or respond or clarify any of the questions that have come through uh, so far. So Dr. Daly. Uh, thanks so much. So um, first, I'm in um, strong support of a full standard recommendation for policy option number one. And then for policy option number two, um, my interpretation of the circumstances is different than Dr. Long's. And I'd be in favor of a full rec full recommendation for those, for example, 50 to 64 with underlying medical conditions. You know, and my reasons are several. Um, first, if it's a group who has underlying medical conditions, plus they have age 50 to 64 and some immunosenescence, and they almost have two risk factors for severe COVID. Um, second, the risk of a particular vaccine adverse event, namely myocarditis, doesn't appear to be elevated in this group. Um, and then therefore in that group, I think the benefits from a booster are really likely to out outweigh any risks. And then third, I think that approach may achieve greater health equity, as has been mentioned by Dr. Brooks and by Dr. Oliver. I, I was contacted by a colleague who reached out with, to me with the observation that many in the American Indian, Alaska Native population um, don't reach the age of 65 years due to under, underlying medical conditions and the effects of social determinants of health. So, you know, I'd be in, for, in support of a full recommendation for those with uh, who are 50 to 64 years old with, un with underlying medical conditions. This is with respect to policy option number two, but I'd greatly appreciate hearing from my uh, ACAP colleagues about um, those 18 to, for example, 49 years old with underlying medical conditions and what type of recommendation they feel like is most appropriate for that group. And then I think I'll leave any comments for policy option number three till later. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, Dr. Fink, are you on the line and would you be able to comment? Yeah, uh, hi. And uh, maybe what I can do is to to walk the, the ACIP through uh, the authorized population and the, the FDA's rationale for that authorized population. And, and maybe that will help to answer some of these questions. Uh, so first of all, I, I just want to start by saying that the statutory requirements uh, for emergency use authorization uh, would require FDA to find that, that a booster dose uh, may be effective uh, to prevent uh, a serious disease or condition. And uh, we're also uh, having to, to evaluate uh, the benefit of the booster dose in relation to whatever benefit exists uh, from the primary series, because anyone being considered for booster dose will have received a, a primary series. So we heard at the VRPAC presentation on uh, Friday uh, evidence that uh, we thought clearly enough uh, demonstrated uh, a risk of, of hospitalization uh, and severe COVID, uh, i.e. A, a serious condition uh, among individuals 65 years of age and older uh, uh, who had passed some time uh, since their uh, primary series. Uh, 
so that was the, the rationale for, for including that age group. Uh, we did not see uh, evidence presented to support that younger age groups in the general population uh, were at this increased risk. Uh, and in fact, we, we also did not see evidence uh, to support that specific uh, subgroups uh, within the younger uh, uh, population uh, were, were being hospitalized uh, at higher rates. However, uh, we did consider uh, that individuals who at baseline uh, are at increased risk of severe outcomes uh, of, of COVID-19 um, would reasonably be expected to be at more severe uh, or at higher risk of, of severe outcomes in hospitalization, uh, uh, even uh, following the primary series with weaning of protective immunity. And so this was the rationale for including in the authorized population individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk of severe COVID, whether that risk is due to underlying medical conditions or, or some other factor. Uh, and finally, with re regard to the third uh, uh, component of the authorized population, uh, we also considered that frequent uh, and unavoidable uh, exposure to SARS-CoV-2 would increase the risk of symptomatic uh, COVID, which along with it uh, would, would result in an increased risk of serious complications of COVID, which could include uh, severe presentations of COVID, but could also include uh, other serious complications such as, as long COVID. Uh, and so, it was with, with this thinking in mind and considering groups uh, that have both frequent and unavoidable uh, exposure uh, to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2 that we decided to authorize the, the booster dose uh, in institutional uh, or occupational settings. Uh, and so uh, this uh, construction you know, really differentiates uh, those groups who have frequent and unavoidable exposure to the virus in institutional or occupational settings from the general population where we recognized uh, that the, the VRPAC uh, did not recommend uh, that the, the evidence, the totality of evidence, supported use of a booster dose in the general population uh, uh, of younger adults 18 through 64 years of age. So I, I hope that that clarifies what the the uh, intent was uh, for this authorization and in the FDA's thinking. And I'll stop there. Um, Dr. Fink, thank you so much for clarifying the intent. And I, um, you know, ACIP certainly wants to stay within the intent of the uh, regulatory decision that FDA has made. Um, so, uh, you know, we will continue to uh, discuss this uh, robustly. One of the other questions that came up that, you know, uh, I don't know if you're able to comment on would just be specifically the J&J um, &J population and if there would be an estimation of the timing of the availability of a booster dose for that population, um, recognizing I'm, I don't believe there's been a submission. So I just, I just wanted to clarify that. And if you could just make any uh, statement about that, that would be helpful, I think, to understand the interval uh, or the gap that might emerge. Uh, sure. So you know, as, I, as I mentioned yesterday, um, currently there, there are no data available to inform the interchangeability of, uh, of authorized COVID vaccines, uh, either for completion of a primary series uh, for, or for use of a booster dose. And so consequently, uh, the Pfizer uh, BioNTech COVID vaccine uh, is authorized for use as a booster dose among uh, certain individuals in the authorized population who have completed a primary series of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, as, as you know, uh, we do have a, an application uh, for uh, an EUA amendment for Moderna uh, COVID vaccine booster dose under review 
and we are working diligently uh, to get that completed. Um, I also uh, am very sensitive to and, and understand the desire for, for flexibility uh, around use of COVID vaccines, as well as uh, the concern uh, about individuals who uh, receive the Janssen vaccine, which data show uh, continues to provide very good protection against uh, severe outcomes, including uh, hospitalization and death, uh, although uh, notably not to the, the same stellar level uh, as the primary series of the, the mRNA vaccines. Uh, as, as a physician, uh, I am frustrated, as I, I know many of you are, uh, with the lack of data uh, that would allow for a uh, regulatory allowance uh, and also that would allow for evidence-based uh, recommendations from the ACIP and evidence-based practice. And I can assure you that, that FDA is, is working diligently uh, with vaccine manufacturers as well as uh, with our other partners in, in federal government, including NIH, uh, to arrive at a, at a solution expediently uh, to address the situation uh, and to uh, provide a solution that will comply uh, with with legal requirements. Uh, so I I don't know that I can I can provide uh, a specific time frame, uh, but I do know that uh, Peter Marks is is on the line also from FDA, and if you'd like to add anything, um, he's, uh, please go ahead. Dr. Marks, do you have... This is Peter. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is Peter Marks. No, th thank you, Doran. I think Doran summarized things very nicely. Um, I think we understand at FDA uh, the relative urgency here um, of trying to have a solution for anyone who's been vaccinated uh, with any of the authorized or approved vaccines. Um, and, and unfortunately, we're not in a place right now which I can give you an exact timeline. Uh, but I, I can tell you that we will proceed with all due urgency um, to uh, try to get there as uh, rapidly as possible, working with uh, the various vaccine sponsors um, and with all of the available data to make a science-based decision um, uh, so that we, we, we have something that is based on evidence um, uh, to bring forward. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fink and Dr. Marks, uh, for your comments. And uh, again, we really appreciate that everyone is working towards, you know, the, the intent of trying to really protect the American public in the most common sense way possible. Um, and we'll just, you know, point out that I think the concerns raised by the committee are really ones of equity in ensuring that um, the FDA, the CDC, uh, all of our federal colleagues, our clinicians on the front line and our public health colleagues can make sure that we are uh, working to uh, achieve equity in, in all aspects of our vaccine policy. Uh, and this is a particularly important one. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go over to Dr. Beth Bell uh, for questions and comments. And actually, uh, for our ACI members and other liaisons who wish to comment. Um, since we have not hear, heard anyone um, speak against policy question one, what I'd like to do is just focus on policy questions two and three in particular. If you, for some reason, uh, disagree with policy question one, please go ahead and comment on that. Uh, but otherwise, you can just uh, move forward with two and three. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Lee. And I apologize in advance if I go over my two minutes a lot of time. I uh, tend to be a little bit verbose, but I'll do my best. First of all, I do really want to make one uh, big picture comment and reflection, which is that, um, you know, there's been, I think, some confusion, lack of clarity about what does the FDA do and what does the VRPAC uh, as the advisory committee and what, does, uh, what do we do with CDC? And we now have author emergency authorization from FDA for um, giving a Pfizer-BioNTech booster to people who got a primary series in these various categories. So that means that um, this booster is available to those people um, in the United States. Um, what we need to be doing, the ACIP, is to look at the totality of evidence um, and uh, think about 
what makes the most sense using the tools that we have, as Dr. Um, Walensky said, to protect as many people as possible and how do we operationalize this considering other things like feasibility, for example. And the other thing I would like to say is that while we are considering what's before us, which is um, this one question, it's a very narrow question. And I think um, there are many, many moving parts. There are many competing priorities. There are the issues that we're, you know, we don't have where these are only for people who receive the Pfizer primary series, which is a bit of a logistical nightmare. There's potentially uh, vaccination authorization for children coming up. That's a very important consideration. There is the other vaccines as we've been talking about. And so I think it's I'm sort of wanting to urge committee members to not get stuck in, um, you know, what might not be uh, questions that should be, we shouldn't be trying to definitively answer questions or come up with policies right now in the midst of all of these moving parts and remembering that, as Dr. Talbot said, if we really want to move the dial here with this pandemic, we need to get more people vaccinated with the primary series. And that should be the focus of the public health infrastructure, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so given uh, all of that um, and uh, putting aside a recommendation number one um, or policy question number one, um, I and thanks to Dr. Fink for clarifying the thinking of the FDA, it appears from that that, that um, since we have no evidence of, of waning vaccine effectiveness among uh, people younger than uh, 65 who have, have underlying medical conditions, it seems like to me what we're doing there is saying that we should, um, we want higher vaccine effectiveness um, for some population of people uh, under the age of 65 with underlying medical conditions. And um, I'm a bit concerned about um, that being somewhat of a um, logical inconsistency and that there, we may end up causing ourselves uh, more problems uh, than we might have anticipated. And also recognizing that there is nothing that precludes anyone in that uh, with an underlying medical condition from getting a vaccine if they got a primary series with Pfizer. So um, I have to say I don't have a huge amount of enthusiasm for ACIP making a recommendation with no evidence um, for a population looking to boost vaccine effectiveness above in some population above that of others. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll stop talking. In terms of policy question number three, I think that there is ample evidence that people such as healthcare workers are, um, do not have repeated exposure in their workplace. Um, they're, they're using PPE as they should and they're following the other, poli the other policies uh, within the healthcare setting. Um, there's lots of evidence to suggest that healthcare workers who become infected become infected because of exposures in the community. So I'm a, a little bit, I, I actually don't believe that that third statement is scientifically correct. And I would say the same about teachers. Um, as I said yesterday, I think that perhaps a case could be made for vaccinating healthcare workers to um, reduce the incidence of infections that they get because of exposure in the community and to therefore reduce absenteeism among vaccinated healthcare workers. So I don't know how to address that, but I don't feel ecstatic about voting um, for a booster dose in a population based on a rationale that, that I don't actually think is uh, supported by evidence. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Lair? Thank you. Um, I would very much like to thank the work group. I've been wrestling with this decision for days now, and it was a succinct and excellent summary of what the questions are. I am in favor of policy question number one. I am against the standard recommendation for policy question number two and number three, although I might consider um, a judgment call on those two. I feel the goal is to decrease hospitalizations, 
And overall, I think that the vaccinations will decrease hospitalizations, but I also feel that we're getting too much ahead of ourselves and that we have too much hope on the line with these boosters. When I was running the numbers, even if we gave boosters to all 13 million um, people over 65 who've had the Pfizer vaccine in the past, that might be about 200 fewer hospitalizations a day, which is a lot. But considering that we have 10,000 hospitalizations a day now, it's probably not that much compared to the goal of getting children hospitalized or getting the unvaccinated hospitalized. However, having said that, um, we shouldn't let the perfect be in the way of the good. And if we can do a little bit of good by giving boosters to people over 65, I'm in favor of that. As for the other two policy questions, it's pretty clear from public comments and from my own anecdotal experience that people want boosters. I agree that there's no data, and so I'm hesitant to make a standard recommendation, but I could see making a recommendation based on clinical judgment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lehrer. Dr. Cohen wanted to just make a brief uh, statement. Thanks, everyone. I just want to um, uh, say a couple of things to help guide the discussion. Um, the first one is that this is an unusual situation and is not the way that we typically, it's not, it's not working in our typical vaccine policy development framework in that um, we don't have a public sector, uh, public vaccine and private vaccine. So all of this vaccine has been purchased by the US government. And because of that key difference, um, the FDA EUA alone is not sufficient to allow for access to populations that aren't also covered by some sort of ACIP recommendation, be it the standard recommendation or the uh, or the more individual decision making focused recommendation. And so I, I do just want to make sure that that is um, that that's clear to everyone. So a dis like, for example, a vote. Um, yes to the first one and no to, to two and three would mean that only 65 year old and up were eligible to get a booster dose at this time, um, given that this is government purchase vaccine. Um, the other comment I wanna make is um, uh, the, I am hearing from all of you the very important and clear um, point that the public health goal right now should be to get people vaccinated who are unvaccinated. Um, but I do want to also um, frame this, um, and, and there are multiple competing priorities at the public health level. Um, a permissive recommendation, if you go back to how we used to, in our um, in pre-COVID days, the way that we framed a permissive or individual or shared clinical decision-making recommendations, as many of you know, they have many, many names, um, has been to think about it as a public health program for a full recommendation, um, but a permissive or uh, individual clinical decision-making type of recommendation um, that you are considering for policy questions two and three would not require the same public health uh, uh, focus as a more full recommendation, if that makes sense. Um, so I imagine that um, individuals in those areas would go get their booster dose is if they chose to do that in pharmacies and in other places that weren't as significant, wouldn't have as significant of an impact on, um, on all of the many competing priorities of public health. I, I don't want to overstate that, though, because clearly this will have some impact on public health. Um, but the goals of a... a, 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 a the standard recommendation would be the goals of public health at this time, which is a primary series for all individuals 12 and up. And if you voted yes to policy question number one, a booster dose for 65 plus, as well as the additional dose for immunocompromised persons. I just want to make that clear. Um, thank you. Uh, we still have a series of hands raised, so I'll ask uh, folks to keep it as brief as possible. Um, Dr. Sineas. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I agree with what others have said, um, that the top priority is to vaccinate the unvaccinated and that any recommendation should not detract from this uh, priority and this goal. Um, for uh, question number two, I think that 
um, if uh, we are considering this question, uh, that the language should be kept as simple and as easy to implement for providers um, while allowing for some, uh, I guess, shared decision making or discretion and flexibility uh, for providers to uh, pro uh, provide this additional dose. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sineas. Um, we'll go back to Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I just wanted to say that I absolutely agree with uh, Dr. Bell's comments. Um, and then with that, I have some um, questions about um, underlying medical conditions um, in policy question two, and whether pregnancy would be included in there or not. Um, just, you know, I, I, and from what we heard yesterday, probably should be, but I just have that comment. And then in policy question three, my other concern is, and what I mentioned earlier, I don't think that really includes um, vaccinating healthy, otherwise healthy individuals who are in, who could themselves become infected and be caring for someone at home who cannot be vaccinated because either they're not eligible yet or, or for whatever reason they cannot be. Um, so, because that's not an, a personal exposure, it's exposing somebody else. However, that may, if that is included in the wording for, um, in policy question three, if it were um, approved, then, um, you know, I just think that that needs to be included somewhere in there if policy question three is approved. Um, and then finally, I really, I, I know we're just talking about the Pfizer vaccine, but I don't, we just cannot continue to ignore the, um, the Janssen product and the individuals who received it. And there are data from, at least a study from, um, from your, I think, I believe it's Europe, with the uh, heterologous um, dosing with the adenovirus spectre of the AstraZeneca and uh, the messenger RNA vaccine, and actually that it was safe and got, and it was actually um, had good boost, good boosting of antibodies. So I think that it's similar, but certainly not the same. But I, I can I just don't think we can continue to ignore that population. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll go to Ms. McNally next. Thank you. On policy question two and three, I am hoping the CDC can comment on communication materials education materials for providers in the public on that need assessment, particularly as it relates to question three. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ms. McNally. Uh, this is Amanda. I can respond to that. I, I, we meant for there to be a slide focused just on this issue, and I believe we forgot uh, in the late hours of the night last night, but um, the answer is absolutely. Um, in the same way that we have provided educational materials for um, individuals to help understand which vaccine may be best for them um, for the primary series, given the various um, uh, various differences in um, uh, of, between the vaccines. We will um, have, have materials both for healthcare providers, public health, as well as uh, to the public uh, to support this decision making. And the, um, the slides that uh, Dr. Dooling laid out will form the basis of some of those uh, considerations that people can um, can think of when they're, if, if, if this is the direction ACIP goes, um, we can have a series of questions and things to trigger people's thinking through uh, their individual uh, benefits and risks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on Dr. Paling and Dr. Long, and then I hope we can go to our liaisons. Um, Dr. Paling. Okay. Thank you for this um, robust discussion. One of the things I'm thinking about is policy question two. I agree. When we looked at the overall everybody with high-risk medical conditions, we saw that vaccine effectiveness remained robust, and that is really good news. At the same time, from our clinical experiences, we know that there are persons with high-risk medical conditions who are very fragile, and the minor is cold, will cause serious, uh, cause them um, to be out of control and leads to hospitalization and significant disease. And so how do we 
I'm tr struggling with how do we make sure those that are the most medically fragile still have access when they're younger than 50 or 64 years of age. Over. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Uh, we'll move to Dr. Long. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Lee. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a real problem. Uh, I even misunderstood that FDA explicitly would want this booster only going to people who had received um, uh, Pfizer before. And I understand the lack of data and can't be recommended for the others, but I do also understand uh, uses that are valid that cannot be approved because the data are not there. So I just don't understand how later this afternoon we can say to people 65 and older, you're at risk for severe disease and death, but only half of you can protect yourselves right now. I just don't understand how that could will play out uh, so uh, it, it might be the right thing to do, but I might vote against it because I, it, it just isn't, uh, sounds like a, a good public health policy. Um, the second would be about pregnant women. Pregnant women are the age where they have had robust responses to these vaccines, and there's no evidence at their age that they have substantial waning. So I would not include pregnant women in this. Um, booster right now. Uh, and I, I also then will uh, speak before some of my practicing uh, colleagues. I see Dr. Goldman's hand up there. This individualized decision making is going to mean that people of education and wealth and ability are going to find some reason they're going to go to a uh, provider, a pharmacy probably that isn't as careful as mine here in Gladwin, that'll uh, they'll get their their dose without uh, really significant uh, uh, need. And again, Dr. Fink surprised me because I was thinking of it differently. The FDA said if you were originally at risk for severe disease before you got vaccinated, you should be in the considered group. Where I would say if you're significantly at risk because of underlying whatever, and you're at risk for waning, then I would say the data are incomplete, but we think the benefits now would outweigh those risks. But so I don't like the shared decision making. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. And actually, I, I wanted to um, uh, give a heads up, Dr. Eckert, if you are online and are able to you know, provide your opinion or any early thoughts that would be really helpful to us from the ACOG perspective. Uh, but just to state, uh, Dr. Long, that I think uh, many of the members have uh, highlighted and articulated some of the concerns that you have around um, equity uh, and access. So I just want to, um, you know, uh, state that I don't, I, I don't, I'm not sure what else we can do at this point, but we were going to continue to uh, emphasize that that is important to the committee. Dr. Eckert, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak. We had a call among ACOG uh, people two days ago, and the general consensus definitely was to feel positive about boosters. Uh, at the same time, we recognize that Many of the initial pregnant individuals who are vaccinated were healthcare workers and were in the first round. And so they uh, may well have been delivered by now. Um, and so it could be a little bit uh, time sensitive as far as wondering who should get boosters and who shouldn't, depending on if they're postpartum or lactating or not. So it's a, it's a bit of a complicated question admittedly, uh, but the general feeling was that given the severe disease that we are seeing and the fact that many of the pregnant individuals were in the earliest wave of vaccinees, that considerations of boosters is something that ACOG is in favor of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then, you know, I, I'm going to apologize, Dr. Duchin and all of the art liaison colleagues who have been waiting patiently. I'm just going to jump in really quickly as a member and just provide a uh, comment. Many of my colleagues already brought up the issues I wanted to raise, but I wanted to take a closer look at slide 12, if possible, on um, Dr. Oliver's presentation, which shows the age-adjusted weekly COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates, if you're able to pull that up. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, what she mentioned, which is the uh, vaccinated slide 12, sorry. 
<laughs> uh, the vaccinated versus unvaccinated for the 50 to 64 year olds. Um, although it is 22 times higher compared to 13 times higher for the 65 and older, um, the baseline rates of hospitalization are higher in the 50 to 64 year olds, likely due to additional medical conditions. And so in, in particular, I wanted to, I guess, uh, you know, uh, upvote some of the uh, considerations brought together by my colleagues around uh, 50 to 64, having attention to that group, not only from an access perspective, an equity perspective, but also just from a risk perspective and the potential risk for severe disease. Um, uh, if you can get to slide 12, but it's okay. I, I've made my point. It's all right. <laughs> I think I will just uh, move on. And if you can keep it to a minute or less, because what I would like to do is head us towards a break so that our team can work on revised voting language and then bring it back for discussion. So um, we will um, ask our liaison members to provide comment. Dr. Duchin first. Thank you. Uh, I will never delay the break. I just want to um, highlight the equity issue that's um, illustrated in our own COVID net hospitalization data, where hospitalization rates among 50 to 64 year old non-Hispanic uh, American Indian or Alaska Native Black and Hispanic or Latino people are higher than those among non-Hispanic uh, whites and Asian Pacific Islanders who are 65 years of age and older. So uh, there really are high, younger uh, people, uh, non-white populations have higher hospitalization rates than uh, white and Asians who are uh, in the 65 and older group. Uh, secondly, um, in the context of the third dose for immunocompromised persons, uh, we have clinical consideration language uh, that sets a, a rather high bar for defining who's immunocompromised. And if we're going to look at a, a recommendation for people with underlying medical conditions, I encourage ACIP to be clear about um, uh, what is being um, considered to be an immunocompromising condition. I imagine it will not be uh, such a high bar. And then finally, from the public health, local public health perspective, uh, despite the um, wicked complexity of this problem, we really do need simplicity in the guidance for implementation success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duchin. Um, Ms. Howell. Yes, thank you, Molly Howell with the Association of Immunization Managers. I again wanted to echo uh, the need for simplicity, including if um, option number two is chosen, allowing people to be able to self-report if they have an underlying condition and go to large vaccination clinics and not require any proof or prescription. Um, I also do believe that, yes, we need to get more unvaccinated vaccinated, but there are many local areas that have a large proportion of the population unvaccinated and uh, are struggling with healthcare worker infrastructure and policy question number three, and the decision could significantly assist uh, healthcare worker infrastructure in areas that have large populations that are unvaccinated and experiencing outbreaks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howell. Dr. Goldman. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I'll be as brief as possible. And Dr. Dooling, Dr. Oliver, great presentation as always. As usual, Dr. Long kind of reads my mind. Um, I'm really concerned about all of these recommendations because I don't know that we really have the overwhelming evidence to recommend them compared to the great benefits of the primary series that we already have, and this is the disease of the unvaccinated. What I'm really concerned about uh, from a boots on the ground perspective is the unintended consequences of policy questions two and three, and that if they are implemented, may be completely irrelevant and superfluous. Because what we're already seeing now, as soon as the Biden administration advised that boosters were going to be a guarantee, I have patients who have already gotten vaccinated with a booster dose without anyone asking why. Pharmacies and other vaccinators were giving it to patients without any reason whatsoever. So the concern is from equity is that if we put this in place and require some type of certification from a physician, patients who have diseases who can't get into physicians because they are already in a health disparity situation and can't get into a doctor to get a form signed to get a vaccine won't get the booster. Or if we don't require anything, then people are just going to go and get vaccines without any reason and, for lack of a better term, misrepresent their underlying conditions just to get a booster. So I think two and three are fraught with peril. Uh, they'll be superfluous and they'll create great 
inequities and problems with Im- implementation. So I'm really concerned about the data for boosters in general, uh, but especially about two and three. Over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goldman. Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, this is Nirav Shaw. I'm speaking on behalf uh, of state and territorial health officials in my capacity as president of ASTO. And over the past few weeks, uh, we've had a chance to speak with and get the pulse from state health officials across the country uh, in connection with boosters and the rollout and two prevailing themes have emerged. Uh, the first is in connection with policy, question number one, and that's a topic that's been covered, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, which is some permissive allowance for use of a mix and match strategy, particularly in long-term care facilities. Boosters will be peaking around the same time that our various states' vaccination forces will be asked and pressed into service to provide first shots for, for example, children 5 to 11, to say nothing of flu shots and other healthcare needs. Uh, having to go back to a healthcare facility or a long-term care facility in a few weeks to pick up those who received Moderna will pose a significant operational challenge. I, I recognize Dr. Fink and others note that we don't have definitive randomized controlled trial data on the efficacy of mixing and matching, state health officials would request that as ACIP has done with respect to severely immune compromise, making an allowance for a preference for the same vaccine, but if not possible to allow the mix and match approach. I recognize we don't have all the data, but we don't think that should be taken to mean we're tabula rasa. Directionally, we have good reason to believe that the mix and match strategy will will be uh, applicable. The second observation from state health officials is for extreme clarity, as Dr. Duchin and, and, uh, and Claire mentioned a moment ago, and Molly, um, particularly on, on policy questions two and three, uh, the language here, while, while I see it on the screen and understand it, in practice will leave open a lot of questions. For example, the US CDC has four tiers uh, for the risk of COVID for underlying medical conditions. Uh, will it be all four of those tiers or will it only be certain of them? If it is indeed all four tiers, that includes, for example, those who are overweight, which is about 73% of the population. If the intention is for boosters to be somewhat narrowly construed to only those over 18 to 64, if we we include all four of those tiers, uh, we'll soon get to a point where overweight plus coronary artery disease plus hypertension means that policy question two encompasses most of the population. Similarly, clarity around uh, number three with respect to which occupations and which settings, that type of clarity will help avoid the patchwork of different states taking different policy approaches that we saw earlier with respect to the primary series. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. Uh, Thank you so much. I agree with um, many of the comments that have been made already about um, uh, policy question one, I'm, I'm going to skip over two. I really want to talk about three and the issue of health equity, because I do think that when we talk about equity, I think, uh, especially for underrepresented minorities, um, uh, the implication here, I think, is that the, it really the risk is for underlying medical conditions in this population. And frankly, the vast majority of the data around frontline workers um, who are not healthcare workers primarily, but who work in settings um, that put them at risk um, that may not have the same uh, ability to uh, be protected by PPE and other practices that we have in healthcare settings, for example, first responders, et cetera, and who are also early in the rollout, as well as people who in these frontline settings, such as uh, frontline uh, food workers, et cetera, who live in communities at higher risk are going to be in and of themselves at higher, uh, at, at overrepresented uh, for in uh, high-risk groups. And we've already seen those hospitalization data. We know that uh, household density, um, uh, living conditions, et cetera, for these individuals are um, already the risk. It's clearly not a, bio- a biological driver that we're talking about for underrepresented minorities. It's really about social determinants of health. And I think if we um, uh, look at the data around hospitalization death, which I think is what the point of boosters or primary vaccines were, um, these, this is driving the pandemic overall, in addition to unvaccinated people. So those vaccinated people who are in these high-risk groups and won't have access to boosters um, uh, is going to further the inequity in those populations. So I'd like to uh, just make a, a case for considering uh, underrepresented minority groups 
who are primarily overrepresented in a lower socioeconomic groups that may drive risk of transmission for them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, Dr. Weiser from the Indian Health Service. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lee. This is Dr. Weiser from Indian Health Service. Um, we really appreciate the comments by Dr. Maldonado, Dr. Brooks, and Dr. Daly, and others regarding booster doses and the impact in severe disease in um, minority populations, especially those under the age of 65. Um, and despite the lack of data on waning of the vaccine in these populations, we do have evidence of severe disease occurring at younger ages in these um, in these populations, as we um, heard earlier from Dr. Duchin. Option two will give our clinicians the flexibility to provide booster doses to patients who are medically fragile, as someone recently put it, um, and have multiple uh, medical conditions that put them at high risk for severe disease. Regarding feasibility, as the earlier presentation showed, the American Indian Alaska Native population have a high uptake, the highest uptake of COVID vaccination. But in many of these vaccines were delivered in our IHS, tribal or urban Indian health organization clinics. Some, but not all. And those that were going to our facilities also have a place that they can go where their medical history is known. And so we can understand those who are most at risk and might need a booster dose. And that increases the feasibility in our um, situation. And I suspect that the population that is accessing federally qualified health centers um, would also receive similar care in a similar setting where their medical history is known and they can actually receive the booster doses um, in a place where they might uh, know their primary care provider and be able to uh, discuss whether or not they want to receive a booster dose. Uh, I think that uh, in our population, booster doses would be um, very welcome and we have a proven track record for feasibility in, um, in distributing those, those doses, so thank you. Great, thanks, Dr. Weiser. Um, Sandra, Dr. Freihofer? Um, Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association, speaking as a practicing physician. Um, I really urge the um, ACIP members to, to vote for a, a permissive use. As Dr. Fink said, the statutory requirement for it is that the booster may be effective to prevent serious disease or condition. There's so much evidence and so much data that's coming in every day, but physicians like myself who care for patients with multiple medical problems need flexibility in being able to recommend for a booster for patients. Um, in, the, in, the, in recommendation number one, it says over 65 and long-term care facility residents. Well, there are many um, patients that could be in a long-term care facility that aren't 65, but they might live at home. And if you don't give flexibility, you are going to be depriving these patients in need of something that could save their life. I understand the need, you know, for making public health decisions, but this is a vaccine that's been paid for by our government with our tax dollars. And there are patients out there whose vaccine effectiveness is decreasing, who have multiple medical problems, that if they get sick, they are very likely going to be some of the ones that die. And when we talk about control, and you can do this, and you can not do this, that there's so much about this pandemic that's out of control. We, when we go out in a public setting, we can't make someone wear a mask. We can't control everything that happens. And I think making vaccine available um, to those that want to get a booster, it's a way of, of, of supporting the people that have chosen to be fully vaccinated and, and appreciating the fact that they want to maintain their protection against this deadly disease. Thanks, Dr. Freihofer. Um, this is Dr. Cohn. I just want to um, lay out um, the next uh, little bit because I think our meeting was supposed to be over at 3.30, and I do not believe it will be. Um, so we are going to take the hands that are up um, right now. Uh, so it's going to go Dr. Talbot, Dr. Daly, and Dr. Dries. Um, and then we are going to take a break. We're going to take about a 10-minute break. 
And then we're coming back. We have been um, taking all of your input and have some um, proposed language for a series of votes that we will present. And then we will open it up for discussion again um, at that time. Um, but uh, I just wanted to tell you where we were going um, and we will take the next three comments. Dr. K Dr. Talbot? Yeah, so mine's actually, I think in all reality, is that almost every American is at risk. We either are obese or um, have a medical problem, or if we don't have high risk, we live with someone who's high risk, or we teach a group of kids that aren't eligible to get vaccine yet. Um, so I, I know that there are very specific caveats that the FDA gave, but in some ways, it may make more sense just to make it permissive for the U.S. population. And that way, patients can have conversations with their providers or their pharmacists to, to really kind of think through those risks. Now, I say that knowing that this is not going to be the way that we stop hospitalizations by any stretch of the imagination. But for those who have been vaccinated, who've done their part and live with someone who's at high risk or who's immunocompromised or who's older or who they want to visit their loved one in the nursing home, whatever it may be, you know, I, I think in some ways it, it may be okay to say if you're over 18 years of age and you would like a third dose, fine. Um, because almost everyone in the U.S. could fall under one of these categories. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Talbot. Um, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to make a couple broad overarching comments before we got to the next stage of this conversation. So one point, <clears throat> one question that I've been asked in the last week or two is, is do the recommendations that we make today reflect who we value in society? And so I just want to be very clear in stating that they most certainly do not. Um, it, the goal is to prevent serious illness and COVID-19 from anyone in the country, for everyone in the country. So, so this isn't about who deserves a booster, but it's about who needs a booster. And so I just want to state explicitly that if you're in a group for whom booster doses aren't universally recommended today, it's crit critically important for you to recommend that the reason a booster isn't recommended for you today is because the vaccine's effectiveness against serious outcomes is already very high for those who've gotten the um, primary series. Um, and then the second thing I want to reiterate, and this is a point that, that, that Beth Bell has made often that I, I feel like bears repeating, um, the decisions that we're going to make are decisions for today. And they really can and will and should be readdressed as the circumstances and as the data warrant. So in other words, these are interim recommendations. For example, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned and frustrated about um, sort of inability to explicitly address heterologous vaccination today or mix and match, but hopefully we can address that very soon. So again, um, everyone is valued, and if you're not in a group for whom boosters are universally recommended, it's, it's really because we think you're well protected. And then the decisions we're making today are for today only, and they'll be reevaluated as circumstances change. Thank you. Dr. Daly, I will reiterate that um, when we come back and see language for consideration for voting on, you will see that we're calling these interim recommendations to address that exact issue that this, this is for the present moment and this will change. I'm hoping that they will change without two-day meetings every time, um, but we uh, will be, uh, these, these, this is an ever-evolving situation. Um, Dr. Dries? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to state that I, I appreciate the fact that two doses are still content, considered to be fully vaccinated. Um, rather than require, you know, for healthcare workers in particular, rather than stating that you need the booster dose as well, because I think that gives employers um, some flexibility as to whether to also require a third dose or not. Um, and I, I agree. I think, you know, we're, we're at the point now where, you know, our staffing is very stretched and we don't have the resources to do the mass vaccination clinics that we did in December and January for our healthcare staff. And so I think, 
you know, similar to Dr. Daly's comments uh, just before, you know, the data really support, you know, lowering of protection for Pfizer, um, and that may change for the others as well. But I think starting with Pfizer um, certainly makes sense and is more manageable from a resource uh, setting. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dries. And um, in the 30 seconds before we take a break, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, one, I just want to um, say that supply for Pfizer vaccine is not an issue right now. I know that that issue came up and I meant to address it earlier. Um, there is plenty of supply to both continue to um, give um, the primary series as well as uh, the booster dose for Pfizer. Um, the the question around capacity and whether or not this will, um, the offering vaccine will potentially um, uh, push out other people who still need to get the primary series. Um, the first priority will continue to be on getting people their primary series, um, regardless of the how the votes go today. Um, and I just want to reassure everyone on the phone of that. And then um, finally, I will say, I think one of the important communication messages uh, uh, as you can think about when considering this is that not everybody will need a booster at six months. The language in the FDA EUA says you can get it at um, any time after six months, um, but um, it, protection starts to wane, um, but people are still very protected. Um, and uh, many um, people may choose to get um, a, a booster dose at nine months or 10 months or eight months or seven months. So I think that the um, some of this will be communicating the um, importance of this, um, that people are still very protected with the first two doses. And um, this is a potentially an opportunity, depending on how you vote, for additional protection. Um, but it's not, um, it won't be protection that everybody needs um, next week. So I will end there and we will take a break um, and we will come back at 3.45.